come on God is good hey brother Matthew can you help me with this let's do rim shots. I don't want to be tempted to sit down can we all be seated let's all be seated we've got a good one for you tonight come on now I am excited to be here today you know one of the things that I have learned is this when there is so much opposition to a particular service I am always highly expectant oh come on now you didn't hear me hold on one second and you know why I get excited in the face of opposition because it's heaven's strategy for strengthening us You've heard me say it again and again, especially in the last month, that whenever we see, Alan, maybe you can help me turn this thing my way just a little bit so that I can, because right now I feel like I'm really straining out my voice. That one's good. Maybe just this one so that I can hear myself a little bit more. So I have come to recognize one thing and I shared it with you again and again in the last couple of weeks that God's primary reason for bringing weights our way for us to carry is so that we can build muscle the Bible says that we should count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations because the trying of your faith is because God wants to develop patience in you you see, it takes a lot of patience and godly character to be able to enjoy the blessings that God has for you. But many of us, while we are yet to fully understand God's method of operation, what happens is we complain. The analogy, one of the analogies that we have used here in the last couple of weeks is that when you are looking to build muscle like big mace you know when you see Kenyatta it looks like two people you see what I mean one of his arms is almost like the size of my leg when you see someone like that rather than just being jealous find out what he does people like that lift weights and so when you go and pay for yourself to have a trainer or you register at a gym somewhere and you actually show up because recently I heard that someone registered at a gym and after six months she wasn't losing any weight and she got mad and she actually went in to complain. And I'm like, wow, the registration alone is not enough to save you. You have to show up. But then at the same time, that is the story of, I would say 80% of the Christians in the body of Christ. Getting to know Jesus as the way is not enough. You have to follow the way and the door to get to the Father. You see what I mean? Knowing your inheritance in Christ is not enough. You have to go after it. You have to pursue it earnestly. You have to hunger and thirst for it. So when you register at a gym and you actually show up and they give you weights to carry, you don't ask for your money back. You don't say you wicked gymnasium owner, you wicked trainer, you godless beast. Why would you ask me to lift weights? Because the weights are there to help you build muscle. And God is the same way when God allows for us to come to oppositions. is because he wants to strengthen you enough for you to carry the blessing when it comes. The blessings, true blessings that come from God are always more than any one of us can carry. So heaven is watching you to see your capacity because God will not give you more than you can handle. That is out of the goodness of his heart. Every time God blesses us, he blesses us more than we have the capacity to contain. And for us at Communion House, it's no longer just a cliche. You see, because some people have taken the word of God to just be, yeah, he blesses you more. No, the Lord has recently said to us through the ministry of his angel, Kosai, that he is blessing us wherein there will be no more room. Hmm. 
Every time God's blessed people in the past, he's always blessed them such that there is no more room. Look at when the manna fell from heaven. The Bible says they collected and collected and collected. And after a while, they were like, no, we can't handle any more of this food. It's too much. Because when they take it home, they can't have any leftovers. They have to consume it all before they can go back for more. And so how do you determine? The other day I was telling my wife, and I think some of the leaders, it was probably on one of those calls also, that I said, when rain falls from heaven, no matter how abundant the rain is, it is only useful to the extent that you are prepared for it. If I don't cultivate a field, if I do not plant anything and the rain falls, do you know that rain which is supposed to be a blessing can then become a problem? Because the field is now taken over by bushes. Because they're like, man, the rain fell and we grew. You could have done something about us before we came. You could have filled the place with good things. Do you know that a lot of believers in the body of Christ struggle with how God blesses other believers simply because it's the same rain that fell that they prepared for that brought them blessing that is not bringing you stressing. Because if all of y'all were poor together, you'd be very happy. But now this person has sown. They have prepared themselves. They have identified what God would have them do with resources. And when the resources come and they're flourishing, now you're getting angry. Come on. The Bible says God makes it to rain upon the good and the wicked. So I want to encourage you that this season that we have come into is a season of muscle building. And that is the reason why when I experience opposition as we're coming close to gathering together, I know that the Lord wants me to build muscle to receive more of what he has for us. On the 3rd of September, the 3rd of this month, we had some of the greatest oppositions. I came this close to saying there's no service. One of the greatest oppositions. And guess what? We went through it. It seemed like a normal service until the angel of the Lord appeared and told us what is about to begin in the world. And you and I both know that every single thing that was said to us, we are already seeing the manifestations of. The angel of the Lord was there and he says, now is Jeremiah 22, 22. That the wind of the Lord is blowing the rulers, particularly the ones that have held the people captive. He says, do not love them, love God. Because the ones who love those rulers will perish with them. And look at what is happening in the world today. We are seeing dominion after dominion being taken out. Somebody called my attention to what's been going on in Italy today. It says now, for some reason, a president or a prime minister has emerged in Italy that is outside of the elitist caucus. And this person is saying no to immorality as the new prime minister saying, no, we are not going to continue to, to promote immorality. Now, what did the angel of the Lord say to us on the day? And I told you what I was seeing. He said to me that now that you're free, tell your brothers and sisters, what are they doing with the freedom? So this lady is enjoying the freedom that has been wrought in the realm of the spirit because God is dethroning principalities and powers and letting the ones that he has chosen come into power. And this lady is coming out now and announcing that Italy is no longer standing for immorality. Italy is standing for what is right by God. A lot of the oppression, praise the Lord, that has been going on. I also was told about what's going on in Iran. Wherein the ladies are saying, no, this oppression is too much. And I told the fellow who brought that to my attention. I said, do you know that for centuries they've been trying to revolt and it's never worked. Simply because they on their own could not overpower the principalities. Let's not forget that every single principality that is, is in place by God's knowledge. Psalms 82, I've broken it down to you. In Psalms 82, God says, you are my children. You have been parading yourselves as gods. He says, but you would die like men because you have not upheld the cause of the fatherless. He says, I'm taking you down and I am promoting the ones that I have chosen. And so as long as God did not take them down, no one could take them down. But the Lord is dethroning the principalities so that people can rise. What else did God say to us? 
Brother Stephan, the Lord says, delete the pronoun they from your vocabulary. Because for most of our lives, especially in the last 500 years, we have always used the word they. Oh, they have to make new roads. Oh, they have to lower taxes for crying out loud. Oh, they have to lower the interest rate. We have lived our lives as though it is in the hand of another. And the Lord is saying, I am bringing you liberty. I am setting you free. This is exactly the order of God. He does this every time there is an exodus. Every single time. And I want to encourage you, the Lord brought us a word on Saturday about bringing us to a place where he, God, gets to help our unbelief. Because there are times wherein we forget that faith is supernatural. We think we have to just have faith. No, the Bible says God has given to everybody a measure of faith. Your commitment is at best seeing that your faith is increasing. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so if God does not release his word to start with, there is no basis for faith. So don't let's hijack the process from God. Let's stick with his process of how faith comes about. So tonight, Brother Matthew is going to bring us a testimony just in a little while here that I believe is going to help a lot of our faiths. So just have an expectation. But before we get into that, because I know what we can be like here at Communion House. We'll go one way and that's it. We're zooming all the way to the end. I want to fulfill the commitment that was made on Saturday about the third order of service in the times that we're in. You know, I told you that there were two things. There were three things, but I only managed to tell you two of them. For the sake of time, I'm not going to repeat myself. But it's got to do with the ministry of the seven angels that the Lord has assigned to his church. The seven angels that were here to give us instruction and to make announcements over us of what next. Now, we talked about the angel of abundance. We talked about Andel, the angel of miracles. We talked about the angel that teaches our fingers to fight and our hands to war by the instruction of the Almighty God. But of the order that I was telling you, I said there is yet a thing that we need to do. And it's got to do with the third angel that has spoken. And the Lord, when I sought the Lord concerning the fact that, okay, we have seen two that we identify by name and there is a third that came and just described what he does. I said, what about the rest? He says, I'm not giving you more than you can handle. And I'm glad because it's like, okay, thank you. We'll take it. One step at a time with Jesus. And so the angel of the Lord that came and says, I am teaching you to fight. He was showing us like children how to make a fist. His assignment is what I want to talk to us about today, what that looks like. Why will God be so interested at this particular time in teaching us how to fight? Adam gave us a preamble into it. Every exodus that we experience begins with us, first of all, being separated from Pharaoh. We have to, first of all, be separated from the system that we have become so dependent on, the system that gives us everything, that gives us onions, that gives us garlic, that even gives us chains to keep us behaved. We need to separate ourselves from the system. And then this system is the one that we've always, it's, it's the system is what we have always looked onto for providence, even though we don't like to admit it. It is the system because the system controls the money and the money controls most of our lives. And the Lord is saying, you know the Lord's been gradually saying to us, he says, it's time for you to ask for mercy and not for money. Because what God has for us as we are proceeding toward the promised land, we cannot buy with money. He says, come and buy you who have no money. But by the mercy of God, we will have more than enough. And God's been saying to us, John, for weeks, stop thinking in money. Why? Because the system that we have been a part of is a system that is based on mammon. When you, when you do something wrong, you get penalized by having money taken from you. When you do something the system likes, you get rewarded by money given to you. You try to break the speed limit when a trooper finds you. What do you do? They don't advise you on how to drive better. They just get you to pay money. 
It is a mammon system. However you swing it. You understand what I mean? The best things are to be enjoyed by the ones who have the most money. Period. You can have faith, but if you don't first of all use that faith to get money, you're sitting at the back of the plane next to the bathroom. But when you have the money, you can sit in front of the, in front of the plane. Where it actually appears like you have a chauffeur that is driving you as opposed to when you're sitting next to the toilet and you don't even know whether the plane's taken off or landed because it was smelling as bad before it took off as it was when it was in the air. And God help you, if you sat next to healthy people, then you have to sit like this. But that tells you the system that we're a part of. It doesn't matter whether you're going to preach the gospel. They don't look at you and look at your intentions and how much good you are about to do for humanity. No, it's all about how much money you have to throw away. That's what determines your privileges. Nobody cares about the fruits that you have. You can be a person with the worst character. You get angry like crazy. You, you are unforgiving. You lie through your teeth. Even when you're not opening your mouth, you're still lying because lies have found ways to come out of your ears. But if you have money, you shall be worshipped. And that is because it's a mammon system. But God's system is everything opposite of that. When people with money came to Jesus, like the rich young ruler, he saw a young rabbi whose ministry was just taking off. And he thought, you know what? This rabbi is going to jump at me. First of all, I'm of the religious order. I'm a Pharisee. I've studied the law. I know the law. I've kept the law from my youth and I have money to throw you away. You throw a crusade and I'll pay for it. Because that was, he came with so much confidence because that has been the order of the day. And then he came to Jesus and Jesus says, why don't you first of all go lighten the load? Go dump some of that money and then you can come back. The Bible says he went away sorrowful because that was really weird. I've had people come to me who have made all kinds of offers. And as long as I see that all they're offering is money, my heart says your money perish with you. Simply because I see where God is taking me and I know that I cannot get there by way of mammon. Because the time is coming wherein mammon will fail. Mammon has an expiration. And so at the end of the day, what do we need more than anything else? We need the mercy of God. And so here we are, wherein we have come to a place of knowing that all the evidences are before us that we are truly experiencing an exodus. God is telling us, don't think in money, because one day I'm bringing a system that is going to run and it's going to be a moneyless system. Because the Bible says, God, Jesus speaking, he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. So when the thrones come of Revelations chapter 20 verse 4, that we are going to be sitting on as kings and priests to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus. What are we doing? The Bible says we shall be priests ministering before the Lord day and night. So if I'm going to be serving the Lord day and night, I'm not going to be using mammon to do it. There's going to be a different reward system. You see, because you know money is a reward system. You work longer hours sometimes, they pay you more, even if it's minimum wage, at least they reward you more. You go to school or you go to take a course somewhere, you learn how to beat the system a little bit more, then they pay you even more. You see what I mean? And so when Jesus says, I am coming and my reward is with me, he is saying, I am coming and I'm bringing a new system. And he's training and preparing us for when that time will come. Wherein people are no longer elevated because of how much money they have. People are positioned where they can be of most influence because they carry lot and lots of good to give to the majority. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto me. God wants to give you a vantage position when you have something to give. We have come to another cusp. And let me tell you one thing that the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying that you have seen Kosai, you have seen the abundance. When did they see the abundance? When they were about to leave Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, tell the women to go and ask the Egyptian masters for gold and silver. And I've explained to you the reason why God said, tell the women. And I'm going to say it again for the benefit of those people who are on their phone when I said it. 
The Lord said, tell the women because he knows that men have ego. Men don't want to receive what they don't believe they have merited. You try to give a man, a real man, something that he hasn't worked for, he will say, no, I can't take that from you. I can't take your money. They would rather go and break their own knuckles to have their own. And God is like, this is grace. It is my reward. It's a free gift. If I send the man, they're not used to it. Man to man. Myself, go ask another man. I ain't going. I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. I'm not going. But women are okay with it simply because women are, I mean, like I tell you, women are a newer model of the human being. They were made after the men. And you know when you have new models, they're usually more advanced, more efficient. And so women recognize that if the Lord says to do it, we just do it. No questions asked. And women are already at the time accustomed to letting the men go and do the work and bring the money to where the money actually is applied for something good. Because you let the men spend the money that they make. <coughs> we know how that is. Toys on lip. Yeah, someone is almost falling over here because she knows how serious it is when you let men spend their own money. Let's face the fact. There's, there's, this is not condescending. It's just what we're not made for it. We're made to make it, but we're not necessarily made to spend it because it's going to be toys unlimited. One day my wife said, we need to be in agreement as to the things that we're asking God. So she said, make a list of the things that we're going to be in agreement for to ask God. Because she said, when we agreed on this, God gave it to us. When we agreed on that, God gave it to us. So now we're going to agree on these other things. And I drew up a list from top to bottom. I just want more toys. There were like three cars out of seven things. It was almost as if I backslided. And the last thing on my list was kind of like something to help communion house, kind of. And she looked at me and she was like, wow. She kept the list that was like a long time ago. She showed it to me again recently. I was like, wow, who did that? I denied it because I'm like, no, that's too carnal. But in reality, God knew exactly what would happen. He says, no, the men, I know their works, their ego is too much. They want to gamble. They want to be too proud about it. So send the women. And guess what happened? As, oh, this is what should happen. As believers, we need to learn to operate like multipliers. Women are multipliers. You give a woman a seed, she gives you a baby. Like within nine months, like one seed becomes like billions and billions. I wish I had given my wife a dollar a long time ago. Who knows what it would have become now? <laughs> Women are multipliers. And so God wants people that will receive that which has been given to multiply and to incubate until it is needed. So the abundance is coming, but we need to know how to incubate the abundance and wait until we get to the place of worship. Because God says, I'm giving you all of those things that with it, you may worship me when you get into the wilderness to a place that I will show you. So abundance is here. And I'm saying that very carefully because one of the things that I'm beginning to recognize is that some of us don't even know that abundance is here simply because we don't see our bank account grow just yet. But let me tell you something. The abundance has to first of all be represented by the mercy of God and faith in your heart. Because when you are overflowing in faith and swimming in mercy, there is nothing that you need that you cannot receive. Mercy and faith can always evolve and become whatever you need. And God did it that way simply because, and you know I've explained to you the principle, the Bible says God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Your blessing has to be preserved in a spiritual state because if everything that God wants to give you becomes material suddenly, some of it will expire even before you get to it. You understand what I mean? You're living in a house with a one, what, what you might call it? One car garage. And God already has 17 cars for you in your future. Imagine if he gave you all 17 at the same time, then you're going to park them on the streets and then you start annoying your neighbor. So rather than be a blessing, you become a nuisance. Rather than getting to places on time, you spend 45 minutes even trying to decide which one you drive. And then you have to pay insurance on all of them at the same time. 
You understand what I mean? And then imagine you go into a car wash. You'd have to call your friends, your neighbors, your aunt, and your uncles to come and help you drive your car to the car wash. And God does not do things like that because he doesn't benefit any one of us. So what does he do? He keeps our blessings where? In a spiritual state in heavenly places. Why in heaven? Because if he brings to you everything that he has for you, even if it's in the spiritual state and it's not in heaven, there are spirit and forces. There are spirits and forces who see what you have in the realm of the spirit and they're ready to grab it from you if it's not in heaven. God keeps it in heaven because they can no longer access heaven. When Satan and his cohorts were driven out, the Bible says that their places were no more. Heaven was shut away from them. They don't even know where it is. The coordinates of heaven was deleted from their system so they cannot even find their way there to attempt to bother God ever again. And so God has put your blessing in the most secure state, in the most secure place. So how then can you access the blessing? By first of all, engaging the mercy of God. Because we come boldly before the throne of grace where we obtain mercy and then grace to help in time of need. And how do you enjoy the benefits of grace? Faith. Grace working through faith. So you see what God is doing with us? God is already establishing his kingdom in our hearts before we see the millennial reign begin on the outside. Because in the millennial reign, we're going to spend two things, grace and mercy. But that grace is accepts, ac accessible through faith. So what will be the actual currency? The currency will be faith. But the instrument is grace. You understand what I mean? And your ability to be able to apply it is mercy. Now, these things are foundations because we're going to spend, God willing, the next couple of weeks talking about what happens between exit and between that great festival or celebration wherein we present the gold and the silver to God. It's a long process. It's a long journey, but it has already begun. And that's the good news. The good news is that the exodus has already begun. So they accessed the abundance by asking for what? For gold and for silver, right? And if you want to study on your own and you want to appreciate better a good understanding of gold and silver, what you need to do is, let me put it this way, if you want to understand better the grace and the mercy of God, you need to go and understand gold and silver. Because when God asked them to ask for gold and silver, all through scripture you see gold and silver representing the mercy and the grace of God. The way gold is refined, the way gold has value, is exactly the way the mercy of God continues to be refined over our lives and continues to have value. So just on a side note, if you want to study it, from those physical attributes, you can understand better the qualities of this spiritual coefficients. But now let's go back to the next thing that happened. The next thing that happened was what? God made a way through the Red Sea. He made a way where there was no way. And that is what the miracle angel was for, and Dale. He made a way where there was no way. When he was introducing himself to us here two weeks ago, what did he say? Was he just last week? Was he just Tuesday last week? I think it was just Tuesday last week. It feels like a long time because I keep watching that video. He, he showed me a canvas and on the canvas, there was a drawing of a sea and he drew a door. He says, there was no way here, but now there is because I am the Lord's paint brush. That was the angel that I told you literally looks like a paint, paint brush and his hair was sticking out like it had been dipped in paint. He says, by me, the Lord changes the image or the picture of people's lives. By miracle, God changes pictures. And by a miracle, he drew a way where there was no way and that was how they were able to walk on dry ground through a sea. So they've experienced the abundance. They have experienced a way-making miracle. Now, what was awaiting them on the other side? On the other side were enemy forces, oppositions. And so he needed to teach them also how to fight. And that was the reason why he said to Joshua that this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You know, I told you to meditate on Joshua 1.8 because that's what we're going to be speaking about today. So why don't we just do this for the sake of those people who may not have meditated on it or read it in recent times. Let us start from that and just read it again. Even though I tried not to re-preach that message, I, I felt like I needed to kind of give us a refresher here of the first two things. So the next thing is now we need to prepare to take, over, to take on 
opposition. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Hallelujah. So let me just quickly say this to you. The Lord said to me, he said, I am doing something in here today. And the Lord is preparing our hearts for the peace that he is bringing. As I opened that Bible, I saw children flying kites in the air. And let me tell you something. For those of you who don't even know the meaning of what I just said, I'm going to break it down to you. Do you know that the airspace above us has been a battled, has been a battlefield in recent times? The Bible says, and there was war in the heavenlies. The princes of the air, the spiritual wickedness, where are they? They are in high places. The air has become a battlefield. Media, everything that is being thrown out, fear is being pumped out, wars and rumors of war. The actual wars are fought in the air, missiles flying, and then the rumors of war are also in the air. All you need to do is have a device that can capture what's in the air and you're going to be picking up lies in the news you're going to be picking up contempt in, on social media you're going to be picking up conflicts and all kinds of things and so when the lord is showing us that once again we can fly kite in the air for peace he's letting us know that he is bringing peace upon the earth and so let your heart begin to receive it and i asked the lord i said lord why why do we need to know that now he said to me, he said, because if we don't see the joy that is set before us, many of us will not be able to endure the conflict that the miscreants are bringing. You know, I told you about the miscreants. I told you about the, the, the disturbances that we're going to see in the world from those who think it's their turn, when it, whereas, in fact, the Lord has overlooked them, right? Now, let me bring you up to speed for, you, for those who have not been following. On the 3rd of September, the Lord said that he was removing the rulers. And we, said, we see that the rulers are going one by one. And it's happening all over the world. And after removing the rulers, what did he say? That we would have the liberty with which to do the will of our Father. But we need to set our hearts on the things that we are going to what? The things that we are going to do. So this is exactly a progression, one page after the other. The Lord is unfolding his government and his administration. All right? And so one of the things that we need to know is that if the Lord is saying to us that we have come to that season of experiencing such breakthrough and having such peace, it's not just peace for fun. We need to know what to do with it. And we need to know how to be able to press into that peace because not everybody gets to experience that peace. Let's keep reading Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. I had to cut myself short there because I was going down a rabbit hole and we wouldn't be out of here if I continued. So let's go. So this book of the law, the Bible says, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So this is the point wherein we get to break bread. So Alan, if you can just help us distribute the bread and the wine. This is what the Lord said to me today. He said, before you tell them more about Joshua 1 8, I want everybody's eyes open. Because a lot of our instructions are of two types, primarily. God gives us instructions as an army what we need to do collectively. And we have just received one of those instructions on Saturday when the Lord said as we're coming into the new year, so for us, the new year has already begun. We are in 2023 already. And now that we are in this new year, what do we do? What do we look forward to? What are we working with as an army? We're working with Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 19 wherein the Lord says now, go forth and stand at the gate. He said to me very clearly and I shared with you that this particular year we will have to be attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit because our instructions are many. So every time God says go forth, we go forth and when we get to the gate we stand and await further instructions. Because God has brought us to a point wherein he wants to guide us through his intimacy with us. These are the times wherein the prophecies of let him who has an ear, 
hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. God is saying, I am not guiding you by what you can see just, but now I am guiding you by what you can hear. And you know that he prepared us in advance for this? It was two, two years ago in 2020 when the Lord showed me an encounter of what he had revealed to the prophet of God. Joel, who says, in the last days, the spirit of God will be poured upon all flesh. The young men will see visions. The old men will dream dreams and the daughters will prophesy. Some of you were there. I think it was late 2020 when the Lord showed me what it means for the daughters to prophesy. He said to me, he said, the daughters were not allowed into the tent of meeting. And because they needed to know for themselves what the Lord was saying, as opposed to their husband's doctored interpretation, he says they will come by the tent of meeting and lean in. He took me back there. What I'm describing to you was what he was showing me. I saw the daughters. They would sneak around the tent of meeting, the women, and they would listen to what God is saying. And the Lord knew that they were there. So he spoke at a frequency that would travel through the tents. So they did not see, but they heard. And he said, it is imperative for every one of you to be able to operate the same. He says, because these are the last days when darkness covers the earth. When darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, you cannot fly by sight. You cannot rely on what you see. You need to be able to operate also by what you hear. The Lord is saying, we're approaching Jericho and we cannot see what's in there. But if we would listen, the battle would be by sound. The victory will also come by what? By sound. So we have come again to such a precipice wherein God wants to lead us by intimacy. So we need to hear what he is saying. He says, go forth. Yes, I said, go forth, says the Lord. The Lord is saying, I said, go forth. He says, but you can't just go forth and just keep going. You have to wait until you hear the next instruction because I am guiding you to penetrate the gates of hell. The reason why he asked these disciples, what are people saying out there? Was because he wanted to reveal to them that the secret for building his church such that the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it is through what they hear from inside. They said, oh, some say you're a prophet, some say you're a teacher, this and that. It was like, okay, forget about all those things. Who do you say that I am? And when Peter spoke, the Bible says he spoke by the Holy Spirit. And you know just before then, what did Jesus tell them? He says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living waters. The Holy Spirit is not coming from outside you. It's from the inside of you. You will hear a voice saying to you, this is the way. Walk in it. He says, upon this rock, which is the rock of personal revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I want you to track with me here. What did I say? I said there are two ways by which God issues instructions, two types of instructions that God is issuing to us. Two main types of instructions. One of them is for the army collectively. And the other one is for you as an individual so you can function within the army and so that the army can function within the kingdom. So the instruction to all of us as an army is the go forth instruction of Jeremiah 17, 19. But the instruction to you as an individual is Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. So we need to understand that when the angel of the Lord came, he wasn't teaching us from what I saw how to line up as an army. He was teaching individuals how to make a fist. Because if you as an individual, if you do not know how to fight, then you become a weak link by, in the army. And the enemy can exploit your weakness to penetrate the camp. So it is important for each of us to know how to operate. Okay, at this point, let me just quickly summarize everything that I have said so that you don't miss this and then we're going to break bread. We're in Exodus. We're moving from Egypt to what the promised land, right? Before we get into the promised land, we need Yeshua, we need Joshua to take us in. Moses will bring us this far, but Joshua would have to take us in. That Joshua, his name means God is our salvation. It's essentially the name that we now call Jesus. 
Okay, Yeshua was translated in the Old Testament as Joshua, in the New Testament as Jesus, which became Jesus. And so we know that Jesus would have to come, set foot upon the Mount of Olives, before we can see the promised land here on earth, which is the beginning of the millennial reign. Are you tracking with me? And so now we've seen all the evidences because he said to us, the rulers will go, you will be promoted into their place and now that you're free from them, what are you going to do with your freedom? You need to be attentive to the steps. Now, how do we begin our journey? By engaging the spirit of abundance. And what do we need for the abundance? It's not a lot of money, but it is a lot of mercy and a lot of faith because that is what we will spend along the way. You understand what I mean? And so he brought us his angel of abundance and also introduced us to Andel, the angel of miracle, so that we have access and entry into the, prom into the promised land. Now, but for us to be able to now go through the opposition that is along the way, what is going to happen? Now, let me say this that I hadn't said before. You see, I told you that once the rulers have been deposed by God, those who are in their courts, the second class elites, they would want to regroup and take the position of their bosses. But God says, I have rejected you. I am bringing my own into place. The reason why it is important for us to know that is because we have to anticipate their commotion. So a lot of the disruption that we're going to see, including the people that want to draw the United States of, of America into war, God showed that to me on Saturday. I was standing here and the screen appeared and there were two tanks and an eruption that happened between them and the Lord said, you need to pray against that because that does not have to happen, right? And the people in the US who wants to make it happen are two political leaders that have to be deposed and God said, I have chosen groups like yours all over the world to speak speak of their removal and we have announced it so we know they're coming down the two of them I couldn't tell you their name because it wasn't given to me but I can tell you this much one of them is a man and the other one is a woman and they're coming down and the Lord said don't be sentimental it might not be who you think but it is who the Lord has chosen he just wants you to believe and trust him enough to release your entire faith to see these people taken down so that that way they do not play to that particular trap it is a trap because after I declared it, the Lord showed me what their plan is. They were moving in with these yellow caterpillars. They want to establish a place for themselves and the Lord says, no, they're not. It is your turn, not theirs. So now we are aware of these things so that we can duly anticipate so that when it comes, we are not moved. Okay? We're, we need to be prepared now. So, what are we then to do as individuals? As a family, as an army, we know that we need to go forth and await instruction. But as individuals, it is what we have just read. So with that summary and a little bit of help from the communion, I want us to prepare our hearts to receive clearly what each and every one of us must do. The Lord said the nature of individual preparation Personal preparation is so unique that each and every one must see and hear directly from me. You need to be able to see the Lord is saying with your ears. You need to be able to hear what I am saying and let it become a picture in your heart. And so we know the power of communion. Those people who had lost their way, who had lost sight of the Savior, the moment he broke bread with them, the Bible says their eyes were open and they saw the risen Savior. When the disciples were still in doubt, when Jesus was standing at the shore, the resurrected Jesus, the moment he broke bread, again, their eyes were open and they were, com they were confident that it was the Lord. We need to tap into that grace also today. Father, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Because as we partake of your body today, Lord Jesus, and as we drink of your blood in remembrance of you, let us see the part that we have in you. Jesus says, unless you drink the blood of, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have a part in him. 
while some people called him a cannibal, some believed in him. And the ones who believed in him eventually said to them, when I was talking about the, the body, this is my body. And he gave them a bread. He gave them the bread. And he gave them the wine and said it is his blood. That is the secret to seeing in fullness. So today, I want us, as many of us as are ready to press in, you, if you want to stand up, I would recommend it. But if you can't, you can stay seated. But as much of us as can stand, let us stand and do what Jesus did. He took the bread and he says, this is my body. He took the wine and he says, this is my blood. And then later on, we're told that as often as we have the opportunity, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. We want to have a full recollection of who he is so that we can see our place in him. Because you remember that we are members of that body. But if you cannot see his fullness, how do you even know your room? How do you know where to go? How do you know how to take your place in the body? Ask him to open your eyes. So Father, with Jesus, and we thank you because this is that moment wherein each one of us is plugged in to the channel that the Holy Spirit is speaking on tonight so that we can hear and receive personal revelation in the mighty name of Jesus. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Alrighty, praise God. Let's be seated real quick. From here, we will move fast. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. To make your way prosperous means to have a safe journey. The original word prosperous means to be able to go through and emerge. So it's not about going through and then getting terminated or aborted along the way. It is going through and emerging. That is what the word prosperous means. So how did God say you will make your way prosperous? He says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So that means I'm not supposed to be content with listening to audio Bible while I'm doing my laundry. I shouldn't be content listening to Pastor Moses as I'm going to work and just stop there. I shouldn't be content playing back again and again the testimony of John. I need to open my mouth and speak that word. This is how we're going to be prepared personally. We need to start speaking the word of God. When you think of scriptures, speak them forth at the same time. Now, let me give you an incentive. Because some of us need an incentive to make such a commitment. I told you about the changes that are going on in our world. And that you have a part to play. Wherein it's no longer going to be they are doing this, they are doing this. You will be doing stuff. And Jesus says, I am coming and my reward is with me to give to each one, not according to their belief, but according to their works. So in order for you to be able to have the kind of result that Jesus is looking to reward, you need to familiarize yourself with the power to create things that are lasting because Jesus says, I'm not just going to look at all the works you all bring. He says, I'm going to test them by fire. And only the word of God can create things that are lasting. The Bible says, whatsoever the word of the Lord does stands forever. So don't do things out of sentiments, out of being nice or being a very good person. The rich young ruler, he was trying to get Jesus' attention to his goodness. That was why he said to Jesus, was like, oh, good master. And Jesus was like, I know where this one is coming from. Jesus says, no one is good, not even one. So basically, he says, but my father. Basically, he was trying to tell the guy, you want me to say, oh, you good rich ruler. You see, because the guy was very calculated. How do we know that? After he called Jesus good, he went on to describe what should 
qualify him as good. He says, I've kept the law even from my youth and I have the result to show for it. Look at how much money that I have. Let me tell you something. Jesus was not fooled by the guys trying to say, oh, good master. So by goodness, you're not going to do it. The Bible says our works of righteousness are like filthy rags before him. What could have made the guy good was if he did what God said. Jesus said, sell all of what you have and follow me. The Bible says until you can do all of what the word of God says, you do not have good success. You can have success, but when it passes through the fire, it gets consumed. So for it to emerge, it has to be with a qualifier of an instruction from God that was greeted by obedience and presentable by fruits. So this is the way to start to examine our hearts. Why am I doing what I am doing? Am I doing it for accolades? Am I doing it for fame? Am I doing it to make the other person look bad? You know when someone hasn't called you for a long time, then you will now call them so that you will seem like the better friend. Like, wow, you don't even call us no more. Well, I just decided, you know what, if you don't call me, I'll call you. Things like that will not make you through the fire because it's done out of sentiment out of wanting somebody else to look bad. If you read the Bible so that you can impress James the next time you see him, you're having coffee with James and you're like, oh, do you know the Bible says in Matthew chapter seven verse one, judge not that you may not be judged, verse seven verse seven, asking you shall receive, knock at the door shall be opened. Do you know that in Exodus chapter two verse 15, the Bible says, thus says the Lord. If you are doing it just because you want to shine, Jesus said, let your light shine. He says, but others will see your good works, not your good light. A light that shines that does not produce good works will not make it through the fire. So I say that so that you have an incentive for studying that word of God, for knowing what it says and for speaking what it says. Three things have to happen and I'm just going to mention it quickly. I don't even think we can finish this tonight. You see, this concept of developing a relationship, an intimate relationship with the word of God is so critical in the times that we're in because God is leading you, Matthew, not by what you see, but by what you hear. Let me tell you something. You have to hear, you have to be able to hear rather before you see. Because you don't even know where the blessing is. The ram is caught in a thicket. If you do not hear the voice of God telling you where it is, how would you even know where to go? So forget about the darkness. Direction comes by hearing, not by showing. So how do you receive direction from the word of God? By being familiar with the word of God. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. Let me tell you one of the reasons why you need to speak the word of God. If you don't know what the word of God sounds like in your own voice, the enemy will convince you that God is speaking to you, whereas in fact it is you that is speaking to you. If you are not familiar enough with what the word of God sounds like on your own tongue, when you're speaking it, when the devil sees that you don't know the difference between Jesus' voice and your voice, Because you are speaking the same word, the enemy will allow for you to hear things in your own voice and follow it thinking the Lord has spoken. That's another incentive. That's the third one. The first incentive that I give to you is that you need to be like the like the maidens, like the women who prophesy. How do were they able to prophesy? Because of the fact that they, they were accustomed to hearing. The men were accustomed to seeing. That's why the young men were still seeing visions and the old men were still dreaming dreams while the daughters were being led by what they heard. That's why they spoke. The Bible says a false witness is an abomination, but the one that hears will speak expressly. These are the last days. How does the Holy Spirit speak in the last days? The Bible says in the last days, the Spirit of the Lord speaks expressly. So if you are not able to speak expressly, you are not even engaging the Holy Spirit. You're not speaking the same language. So now let me, let's quickly go back to one thing here. So it says, it shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. What is meditation? Meditation. I'm going to say this very quickly and then expound on it perhaps on Saturday or Tuesday next week. Meditation is essentially what a lot of philosophers today call auto-suggestion. That you need to keep repeating the same thing to yourself consciously until it's able to go into your subconscious. 
That is essentially what meditation is. I tell you jokingly that if all the scripture you know is in your head, the devil just needs to bring you a headache and then you will not know how to rebuttal. You will not know what to say because your head is banging, you forget. Sometimes the enemy brings you something that completely scares you out of your mind and it's almost as if you don't remember any scripture. Because your brain is still part of your carnal flesh and the Bible says flesh will fail. So you need that word of God to be meditated on to the point wherein it sits on your mind constantly. After a while, your, con your conscious mind gets saturated and it tries to dump what's in it. And that's how your subconscious mind gets fed. Let me say this again. Imagine that you have a phone and you're always taking pictures like my wife. After a while, your phone is going to get full. So what do you need? Once the phone is getting full, you know what the phone does? It starts to dump things to the cloud. Because itself is getting full. The other day we realized that my wife was using about 900 gigs of data in the cloud. Whereas a tiny little phone can only hold one, maybe 256 gig. So how is she able to have more data than her phone can hold? Because that phone knows its limits. And it knows that once I'm getting close to the limit, I shoot it off to the cloud. Because my wife takes a picture when she's cooking, when she serves the food, I'm hungry, I'm ready to pounce on the food. And she's like, hold on, wait a minute. And I'm like, oh my God, by the time you're done in posting this to Instagram, I hope I still have appetite. You understand what I mean? It's okay, I know that I'm gonna suffer for my sins when we get home. But hey, you know, I'm gonna just testify for your goodness, I'm getting persecuted. But here is the deal. Your subconscious mind and your conscious mind have that same relationship. Your consciousness is very finite. And that's why sometimes you want to talk to Michelle after she's had such a long day talking to like 500 employees. And she's like, can you say that again? Can you say that again? Because that conscious mind is already full. She needs a good night's sleep to dump it and then start fresh again the next day. So the Lord is saying, fill your conscious mind with my word to the point where it can take no more because once it cannot take no more, it pushes it down into the subconscious mind and that is the seat of power. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the forces that govern life. Let me tell you something, the secret to actually Improving your partnership with God's word is in recognizing that God's word has an office where it works out of. And so if you don't show up in that office, you're working on your own, he's working on his own. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not such a man think he will receive anything from God. What does it mean to be double-minded? To have certain scriptures in your, in your conscious mind that are not in your subconscious. The last thing your subconscious heard was that you are broke. And now you have to go borrow money. But you're quoting scriptures in your conscious mind that says, And oh my God shall supply all my needs. You're double-minded. One part of you thinks you're hopeless. And the other one kind of believes there is hope somewhere. And because of the conflict, God is like, Next. Because the Bible says, let not such a man think that he will receive anything from God. So for you to receive the result of the word of God, your partnership with the word of God has to be executed the way that he prescribes. Which is, God said to, to Joshua, I mean to David, that I want to be able to work in you, but you need to give me substance. That's why David says, he says, the Lord desired truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, so these are two different parts. The inward part is your consciousness, but the hidden part is your subconsciousness because it's hidden from you. You don't even know where it is. Right? And the Bible says that in the hidden part, the Lord desires what? Truth. Because the spirit of man is in that hidden part and it is the candle with which the Lord searches the inward part of the belly. So you want God to bring a light into your life. You need to bring his word into your soul. We keep saying, oh, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet. And like, let me tell you something. It is not these feet that you're looking at. I have an iPhone for that. My iPhone has a torch. So if I don't see where I'm going, I can put it on. The feet that he's talking about is the feet of your subconscious mind where your intentions dwell. You know, the Bible says that the word of God is what? Living and powerful. Sharper 
than any two-edged sword, piercing through what? The dividing membrane between soul and spirit. What is that dividing membrane? The subconscious mind. And he says, because it is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of a man's heart. If you don't meditate on the word of God, your thoughts will always be different from your intentions. And that double-minded man does not receive anything from God. You know, many of us were quoting scriptures. We're like, I believe God is going to heal me. But for some reason, I'm not experiencing healing. And that is because you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh God, I know you're going to heal me. And then you call your friend that does not even believe in God. And that person keeps advising you about all of the medications you need to take and how that sickness can kill you if you don't do something. Now you have completely confused your conscious mind. And your conscious mind is like, you know what, at this particular point in time, it's not even safe to upload anything to the cloud. We're just going to wait until this clears out. So what do we do? Focus on meditating on the word of God to the point wherein it saturates your consciousness and it goes into your subconscious. That is the instruction of God to us as we're going forth. Because you can't go forth if you don't have light. Jesus says there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. Those who walk in the light will not stumble. Do you know when he said that? He said that when people were asking about his return. And now we're anticipating the return, but we do not want the light. That's why many of us will stumble in days to come. But God forbid that any one of us here stumbles because now we have been told what to do. We need to shut down a lot of the noise, a lot of the chaos, a lot of the politics, a lot of the gimmickry, a lot of economic forecast and, and what you might call those things, uh, conspiracy theories, and just focus on what God is saying. And then when you meditate upon that, you know what happens? He says, and then you will. He didn't say I will, not God, but you will be able to make your way prosperous. Why would God trust you to make anything? Only if you have his word. Because the Bible says there was nothing made that was made without the word. So if you have meditated upon the word of God enough, guess what? You have now the same power to be able to make things. So you can make your way prosperous and then have good success. So how do I make my way prosperous? This is where it ties to the third angel. The angel that is teaching us how to make a fist. The angel that is teaching us how to fight the good fight. How to war like a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what the Lord revealed to me? Last week, he said to me, he said, I know you know this scripture, but I want you to read it. He said, because I want something to jump at you when you see it. The word, make your way prosperous, means you will make yourself have a safe journey. Because to be prosperous is to have a safe journey, to go through and to emerge. So if God is saying, there are enemies along the way, there are giants along the way, and you need to make your way prosperous. What does that mean? It means you need to fight. And that was exactly what he was telling Joshua here. He says, be bold and be strong, for I am with you. The reason why I'm telling you that is because I know you will need to remember tomorrow that I am with you when you see the giants you need to fight. So that, that, so that, so that instead of running, you'll be confident. You can only make your way prosperous when you are equipped with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The reason why we meditate upon the word of God, the reason why we speak the word of God and not letting it depart from our mouths is because we have to get to that place by God wherein we're able to take down the opposition along the way. God is saying, yes, I have covered you guys. I have shielded you. When Moses was here with you because you were in transition, he was just using the rod to work all kinds of miracles. He says, but now I have taken the rod and put in the rod away. You now need to bring out the sword and fight. When we hear Exodus, we get excited. Wee oui, wee, oui, manna, wee oui, wee, oui, promised land. But God has not changed his ways. He never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So when God is telling you that the miscreants who are the second class elites will want to take over power and he's telling you to see to it, what is he telling you? He's telling you, get up and fight. And we're not fighting with our mouths on social media attacking people. 
We're not fighting by political campaigns. We're not fighting by scientific discoveries. We are fighting by the word of God because that is the sword of the spirit. So the reason why you as an individual need to develop a loving relationship and intimate relationship with the word of God is without it, you have no sword and there are enemies between you and the milk and honey. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the world. The Bible says the things that are seen are a function of the things that are not seen. All of the commotion that will emerge in the news will first of all happen in the spirit. And for things to transition from the spirit into the natural, they happen in the mind. Many people are beginning to experience it already. You know, my wife was telling me that recently there's a lot of talk about people just becoming lazy. People are, a lot more people are becoming lethargic. They don't want to do anything. And you know why that is going on? Simply because people in the spirit are seeing the battle that is ahead and they're already losing heart. Let me tell you something. It will happen in the natural. Some of it, we will hear it in the news. But before it happens like that in the natural, it will start happening in the spirit and our minds will come under attack. Where are we going to stand if we don't have the word of God to start cutting down the evil thoughts that will come to our minds? The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not humanly instrumented, but they are mighty through God for what? The pulling down of strongholds and beginning with what? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. If we cannot shut down those thoughts when they come, it's over. And let me tell you this, folks. I am happy to announce to you that a lot of the opposition and the opposing thoughts that come, that will come to our minds will not get to our consciousness. We're not even going to be conscious of it. Have you experienced things like this wherein you talk to people and they're like, I don't know, I've just been feeling somehow lately. And everybody's like, yeah, me too. And you can't tell what it is. That's because opposition is coming from the realm of the spirit and is hitting the subconscious mind. That's where you need the word of God to shut it down before it becomes frustration, before it becomes depression, before it becomes defeat. We need the word of God. It's 919, we're gonna have to land this plane, but there is more that I would love to share with you. You see, the Lord has started us on the trend and which is as the service is ending. I don't know how long this is gonna last, but while it is still on, I'm going to ride the wave. As I was coming from that side, I looked at the clock. I was about to close the meeting. The Lord said to them, tell them about Saturday. He said, on Saturday, I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you how to climb a slippery rock. He says, because you have to learn how to do it. I see a man climbing a rock and the rock has moss on it and water was flowing, which is recipe for slipping and sliding. And the Lord, he says, there is a way for you to climb. On Saturday, I am excited to share that with you. I already have an insight into it because there was once that the Lord told me how to climb a rock. He says, the reason why I said I will make your feet like hind's feet. What is a hind? A mountain goat. He said, it's because some things that I have for you, I couldn't put it on the bare ground where the enemy can trample it over. I have put it on the mountain because you are an eagle. I know you will not have any problems getting to it, but you need to know how to mount higher and how to climb higher. Do you know that when David was instructed to go and take Jerusalem, the Lord told him he doesn't have any business taking the regions at the bottom of the mountain. The Lord says you need to go to the top. The regions around the mountain were the places where the original occupants of Jerusalem, the Jebusites, was where they threw their blind and lame people. If you are blind and you are lame or you are old and weak, you cannot climb. So they sent them down to the bottom of the mountain and they only fed them the remnants of what was coming from the mountain. And God was like, I did not make you for remnants. So he says, I have no business with the guys at the foot of the mountain. The Lord instructed David to go to the top of the mountain. 
He says, because that is where you have the balm that will heal you from all your wounds. That is where they have kept their golden shields. You need to learn how to be able to climb the mountain without losing your sword. You need to learn how to be able to climb the mountain without arriving at the mountain too tired to take your position. The Lord is saying that I am weaponizing you people so that you can be an example of what it means to be the outmost of heaven and a regiment of the kingdom. We might not be one million people in this place, but you will see by the time our results become evident and manifest. Many would wish that they had signed up along the line. It's been a tough program around here, but guess what? God is toughening us up for something that the world is yet to see. Uh. Hey, Father, I thank you. You know what is going to happen also on Saturday? There's going to be healing in this place. I felt a very holy anger rise up within me today because too many people are too broken, too many people are too broke, too many people are too bursted around me. And I got really angry in the realm of the spirit, in all humility before the Lord, but I was angry. And the Lord already started to tell me certain things that must happen. So in this place on Saturday, there will be healing. Why? I saw the man that I saw climbing the mountain was climbing the mountain and crying and weeping. And the Lord said to me, that particular kind of weeping is weakening. There is a kind of crying that you cry that weakens you. Have you ever cried to the point where you can no longer speak and you're just, mm, and you're crying? It weakens you because in silence, your bones grow weak within you. And the Lord says, first of all, we need to wipe those tears and strengthen those arms. And the angel of the Lord is going to be with us. So let me say this in conclusion. Brother Matthew, you're not going to feel too bad if you don't share your testimony today because it's almost 9.30 with you. But I want you to mention to us that experience of what happened on the way because it's going to help someone's faith in here today. While Brother Matthew is coming up, I want us to prepare our offerings. I want somebody to be ready to prepare to show the announcements on the screen. But while you're still standing there, come with me very quickly. I need to give you this one to prepare you for Saturday. Okay, anybody that plans to be here on Saturday, go to Jeremiah 7.11. We're not done with Jeremiah. I thought, you know, I haven't said it. Maybe that means we're done with it. But apparently the Lord still has something for us. So Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 is a scripture that we all are familiar with. The Bible says, as this house, which is my house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes. The Lord says, as this house which is called by my name, has it not become a den of thieves? That was the same scripture that Jesus was quoting when he says, they have turned my father's house into a den of robbers, when it is in fact meant to be a house of prayer. What were they doing? They were buying and selling. Please, I want you to pay attention. They were buying and selling. Your heart is for God. The one that dwells in Zion dwells also in the hearts of men. He says, is my house your heart? But right now, there's too much buying and selling going on. Most of your thoughts are about what you will eat, what you will drink, where that money is going to come from, how that bill is going to be paid. And the Lord is saying, buying and selling, I want you to suspend that and let your heart continuously engage me in this season. So meditate on that, prepare your heart for that as we come on Saturday, because God is about to do a great work amongst us. Healing followed by tutoring on how to climb the mountains. So let me bless the offering and Brother Matthew is going to come up. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, if you need a moment to, to prepare your offering, please go ahead and do that right now. I'm actually going to do the same also before I start praying. Let's go ahead and just prepare that offering before we pray. And just so that you're reminded, at a communion house, our focus on giving the offering is essentially to be able to have the offering as another way of showing our worship before the Lord. The Bible says, honor the Lord your God with your substance. As so I want to encourage you, let's not miss an opportunity to make a connection by obedience to the word that has been shared in here today. There's not going to be any other announcements because the only announcement for us today is the one that came from the Lord himself, 
which is for Saturday. And so once you're ready, I want you to lift up your offerings. And for those of you that need to put an envelope down or cash, you don't have to do it now, just do it after the service. You see where it says made new, that's where the offering basket is. And the Lord says, in blessing I will bless you, in multiplying I will multiply you. Father, may you accept our sacrifices today in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you because we know that this house, that these offerings are coming into, we will have more and more fruits to show for it. And Matthew chapter 3 verse 3 says, For this is he who was spoken of by prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Lord, let us continually remain committed to doing all that, we, that is within our power to prepare your way. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're happy to receive our own brother Matthew back all the way from the other end of the world. And let me tell you something, we're literally out of time, but we need to hear this testimony. He started to share it with me and we both knew that everybody needed to hear it. Connect by faith, it's gonna bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, hey. So yep, I'll get right into it. I'll share the why and the how briefly this evening, and then we'll get into the what um, another time soon, Lord willing. And I hope this inspires you. Um, I mean, at one point in my life, I was almost catatonic with mental illness. Um, and, you know, wandered from church to church and uh, college to college and friends to friends and, you know, coast to coast. But obviously God led me here to Communion House. And thank you all for all your prayers that got me through everything. And I remember one time, you know, I was sitting in the front row, another building, but right there where you're sitting, Brother Allen, and pastor was, you know, preaching, praying and prophesying. He said, there's somebody in here. You're, you may be thinking, how are you going to get to the other end of the earth in the middle of a pandemic? But you shall go. Your blessing may not happen till next year, but you will go. And he was speaking to me and next year I went on my father's business visa. So then fast forward to, you know, I think the next year, maybe in the, you know, springtime or whatever. And we're, you know, in another building and it's at the end of service and pastor is prophesying again, he's speaking of a dream, a vision the Lord had given him of a man, you know, right there standing on the beach with the whole vast ocean right there in front of him. But the man was not moving, just waiting, you know, just like in the Bible, that man by the pool of Bethesda waiting for 30 years for someone to take him to the pool and heal him. And I start weeping because I'm like, that is me. Here is where God has called me to be. It's the ocean representing in front of me and I'm just still standing there. Okay, what do I need to do to get there? You know, and I wanna read, thank you for leaving your Bible up here because I just wanna run one scripture, Exodus 14, 15. Okay, because I think this sums it up and I don't need to say much after this. Okay, Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. It's the second book in your Bible. Most people unfortunately stop with the verse prior, but now we're into the next verse. Okay, so Exodus 14, 15, I'm gonna read it. I would have had David Livingstone come up and read it if the Bible weren't here, but maybe another time. Okay, it says, the, uh, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. That's the season we're in. And God does not, he, um, God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called, okay? So I think I'll stop there for sake of time. Lord. And thank you for inspiring us all. 
Praise and God. look forward to hopefully seeing you all on Saturday. Invite a friend. Praise Thank the Lord. You. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. God is good. So just stand right there with me real quick. It's a joy having Brother Matthew back. And when the Lord says he's stirring up faith in us, allowing for us to have our unbeliefs helped. As I was sitting there, the Lord says we need to pray that over everybody, what he just, what he experienced. You see, almost everybody was saying, this is not the time. Don't go. Against much opposition, both in the news and everywhere. Even trying to buy a ticket. The airline kept saying they can't take him. All kinds of things kept going on. But guess what? He heard the voice of the Lord that says, go forth. Communion house. When the Lord says, go forth, and we're experiencing opposition, what does that mean? It means the wind of heaven will come to our aid to get us there. Let us rise up and just pray together. Praise the Lord. Every single person, I want you to just grab the right hand of the person next to you. Because the word of God says to lift up the arms that are weak. For the Lord is about to bring about a performance. The Lord is about to do a new thing. The Lord is advancing his army. He's advancing his church. And God forbid that I'm the one holding back what great thing God wants to do. God forbid that you are the one unable to lay your hand on the plow and keep it there. The Bible says whoever lays his hands on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. So as you're holding this person's right hand, I want you to declare over them. Is there a spare person in the room to hold my hand? Who's that? No, 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 you're already holding someone's hand. Let me not deprive you. Emmanuel, let me borrow your right hand. Who's that? Oh, no, 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 I want to hold just one person. Okay, all righty, yeah. Do you even do your own laundry? Your hands are so soft. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, is this your right hand? No, let me hold your right hand. Praise the Lord. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you because you have commanded for us to lay our hands on the plow and to be steadfast. But many of us do not even know how to begin. So, this prayer tonight is for us to receive the wisdom to know exactly what part of that plow of your kingdom to grab. And Lord, I am asking, putting in a special request for my brothers and sisters today that we will hear you and receive clarity through dreams. Lord, unleash upon us tonight a series of dreams for every single person. If, you, if you've never been a dreamer, begin to dream supernaturally because there's a lot that God wants to bring you up to speed with what? that may take time if it was happening during the day because you'll keep asking questions and debating but in the night the Bible says he gives to his beloved in sleep not just sleep go read it again he gives to his beloved in sleep while we sleep Lord yes download to us the mysteries of the kingdom that we may know exactly where to put our hands in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Emmanuel. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you on Saturday. Six. Thank you.